and I got to the last chapter and I am weeping. I can't read. I'm crying so hard. And my wife's like, let me read it. She takes the book. She starts crying. So we're just passing it back and forth to each other while we tried to recover. I closed the book and I said, I have to make this movie. The acting, the casting, the directing, everything about it was so beautifully done. The script's amazing. So you created a classic. I think I had to be broken down and surrendered before I could get the chosen. And for the first time in my life, I truly grasped the notion that my job and our job is to make the best five loaves and two fish that we can, to bring it to God, and if he deems it worthy of acceptance, the transaction's over. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we're going to be talking with the director, producer, and creator of the international hit series The Chosen, Dallas Jenkins. Dallas has a new amazing film out in theaters now called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. Spoiler alert, it is one of the cutest movies that I've ever seen, and it is phenomenal. It's a movie that you can take your whole family to, your kids to, and get into the Christmas spirit, and it's about the greatest story ever told, Jesus Christ's birth. This interview is a lot of fun because Dallas goes into both his rock-bottom experiences before creating The Chosen and The Best Christmas Pageant Ever, as well as what goes on through his mind to ideate and visualize making such beautiful and amazing art. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening and make sure to give us five stars if you're listening on podcast app that helps the show reach more people. Dallas Jenkins, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to finally do this. Uh, appreciate it. We have a lot of mutual friends, and we haven't, we haven't, but we haven't actually done this before, so it's great to be here. It's great to have you on. Love your backdrop, by the way. I see you already in the Christmas spirit. Well, the Christmas spirit begins hopefully year-round, but uh, for me, definitely the moment that we're past Halloween, we're, we're going for it. Yes. Well, I'm a huge fan of yours, Dallas. I'm a oh, huge wow. fan of you. I'm a huge fan of what you do. I'm a mega fan of The Chosen. What you've created is absolutely beautiful, amazing, life-changing. It's touched me deeply. It's touched, I know, millions of people. Mm. I'm very excited about your latest project. So thanks for coming on. It's really it's really exciting to get to talk to the creator of so many beautiful things. Oh, well, that's so, so great to hear. That's very kind of you. Yeah, I saw your conversation with Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus. But otherwise, uh, I, I, I don't think I knew how big of a fan you were. So that's wonderful to hear. And I'm a fan of yours as well. So this is great. Awesome. Well, I'd love to start with the movie that's in theaters right now because I just got to watch it and it was one of those tearjerker films. It was also very surprisingly adorable. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear about what was the impetus behind the creation of your newest film and then got a lot more questions. So but we'll start with the latest and the greatest. Well, uh, my wife, Amanda, brought home this book, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever, uh, almost 20 years ago and said, do you remember this book as a kid? And I had. I had read it as a kid in public school, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a play that's been performed all over the world. Um, and that's why it somewhat surprised me when I started reading it to my kids, who were at the time were very young, is I'm like, boy, I don't remember it being this good, this witty, this smart, but also this Jesus-y. Like, I read this in public school. How did, how did, they, how did she get away with this? Like, it's, it's so much about... Um, in the context of Christmas in a, in a small town's big Christmas pageant uh, and the notion that the six worst kids in the whole neighborhood that everyone's scared of and that is, they're mean and they're, they're, they're in poverty, they're outsiders, no one wants them around and they hijack uh, the town's Christmas pageant and everyone, of course, thinks it's going to be horrible. Um, and I don't think I'm giving anything away that the title of the movie is the best Christmas pageant ever, but seeing the birth of Christ through the eyes of these outsiders and those in poverty and how that brought them actually closer to the truth of the original authentic story than everyone else just wrecked me. And I got to the last chapter and I am weeping. I can't read. I'm crying so hard. And my wife's like, let me read it. She takes the book. She starts crying. So we're just passing it back and forth to each other while we tried to recover. And uh, I closed the book and I said, I have to make this movie. Um, the, everything about it reflected my heart. It's about kids. It's about troubled kids. I'm an adoptive parent. Um, I have m most of my extended family are also adoptive parents. Um, it's a Christmas. I'm a huge Christmas guy. Uh, the, the, the combination of humor and heart, the fact that it's a very profound spiritual and biblical message that's wrapped in a traditional Christmas classic story that doesn't feel like it's a, a you know, it doesn't feel like you're going to, you know, it's like a church service being forced upon you. Um, I just was like, I, I have to do this. And I chased the rights for years. Every year I would bug the guys who own the rights to this. 
and they always had it set up at some big studio with some big director, but then it wasn't getting made. Maybe because every week I had a prompt on my calendar on my phone and computer to pray for pageant. And wow. I'd like to say I was praying all these wonderful prayers of God's will be done and I'll just submit to it. But I was praying, please don't let anyone else make this movie. Wow. Please save this movie for me. Because I just felt so strongly that he had called me to it and it wouldn't go away. And I think that's one of the reasons or one of the ways I know I'm telling a long story here, but one of the ways we can tell the difference between maybe a, a, a dream or an idea that we have that maybe is just for ourselves. And when something really God has placed on you, a lot of times is time. Time reveals that. And I just every week would be reminded to pray for it. Five years ago, the original studio lost the rights. The original rights holders had it back and they were looking at other opportunities and I'm begging them. And uh, they called me back and they say, uh, we are going to go with a new studio and we're not, you know, we're going to go with someone else. And I thought it was over. Went and told my wife, we were both pretty depressed. And I go into my office at home and I'm just so frustrated and upset. And ping, like taunting me, the reminder comes up, pray for pageant. And I went to delete it because I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't pray for this. I can't get my hopes up. I can't beg for this anymore. And I went to delete it and I felt God just very clearly and strongly on my heart. Don't do that. And it's one of the handful of times in my life I felt that strong of a, of an impression. And I just went, okay. And I was so frustrated and I'm like, okay, God, I'll pray, even though this doesn't mean anything. And I, you know, just please give me the rights. You know, I'm just, I'm not in a good place. And uh, my wife, Amanda walks in and says, I was just praying. And I felt like God was putting it on my heart. This isn't over. And I was like, shoot, I didn't want to get my hopes up again. And a couple of years ago, I reached out again, my annual bugging of the rights holders. And they said, what a coincidence. Just a week ago, the studio forgot to renew. We have the rights back. My mom called me a few days ago, asked me if I'd seen the show called The Chosen. And uh, she, I said, oh, that's funny. The creator of that show is always bugging me for the rights to the Christmas pageant. She says, are you crazy? He's the only one who can make this movie. You better give him the rights. And so... He says, I have to listen to my mom. And so as I talk to you now, uh, the fact that I'm able, Lila, to say that there's a movie called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. It's in theaters around the country. It's got a great critics score. Uh, even the New York Times liked it. And people are showing up in the box office for it is a calling fulfilled. It really is um, a miracle. That's incredible. On, on so many levels, Dallas. And I hope, I know people listening. I mean, I, it's like chills listening to that really mm. your faithfulness and obedience to God in responding to an inspiration to create something really beautiful. And I, I want to get back to the origin story, but first, just for folks who may not have seen it yet, it is incredibly well done. I mean, I think about the, it was a, a Christmas story from the 50s yeah, or 60s, yeah. I, the little kid, you know, you'll shoot your eye out, getting the, the gun for Christmas, super classic Christmas film. This is that caliber or better. The acting, the casting, the directing, everything about it was so beautifully done. The script's amazing. So you created a classic. And I think that's what the critics are saying. That's what the response is. So highly recommend everyone to go out and see it. Uh, I, I am curious in the casting process because the, these kids are phenomenal actors. Yeah. I mean, they really carry the movie. It's they're adorable. They're 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 so funny. Uh, what was it like finding all those amazing kids to be in this film and, and working with them to get them to do such a phenomenal job? Can you believe that it's almost the end of 2024 and soon it will be Christmas? Time is flying. If you want time to slow down and focus on God, especially before this Christmas season, then I highly recommend Hallow. As you may know, Hallow is the number one prayer app in the world with thousands of guided meditations and prayers. There's also sleep stories, Bible stories, content for kids, and so much more. Go check it out today. Hallow.com slash Lila for three months free and join the Pray 25 prayer challenge with Hallow. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy uh, because you see hundreds of hours of auditions from kids all over the country because when you're looking for kid actors, uh, you, you, you don't want to limit your, your search because obviously most kid actors are not experienced. So by definition, every time that you're casting, you're going to find newcomers. And uh, we were just looking for people who could inhabit both the humor and the, you know, the craziness of the story, but also the emotional journey and ultimately the spiritual climax of it. And that's a hard, hard line to walk. It's a hard line to walk as a filmmaker. It's, it's also a hard line to walk as an actor. And so our adult actors, we got Judy Greer, who's extraordinary. Everyone, if you have, if you don't know her name, you know, her face, 
Uh, she's amazing. Everyone loves her. Pete Holmes is a uh, classic stand-up comic and a great comedian. And then uh, Lauren Graham from Gilmore Girls and Parenthood, who's amazing as the narrator and as also has a scene. Um, we just got so fortunate. But the kids, um, if you don't get those kids right, everything else kind of falls to the wayside in a story like this. And they are just so great. And uh, once we finally chose them and then then you got to direct them and you got you know a range of kids and sometimes there's 10 15 even 20 kids in a scene and it's a it's a adhd fest and so you're trying to be a both a director and a parent and a teacher and a leader um so it was challenging but it was worth it they are truly uh beautiful in the film what was the hardest scene to film and why well the climax of the movie where we actually put on the christmas pageant for the first time um, is also the climax of the book. And it's what made me laugh and cry so hard. And so the pressure of getting that right, is very difficult. When you don't have the same tools an author of a book has, where you can't get inside people's thoughts, you have to use all these other tools to communicate. So that wasn't easy. Um, and then we, we took five days, five full days, just to film that that one sequence. And we had, you know, 150, 200 extras at any one time. Um, I'm, I'm managing all these kids uh, all these different angles, you know, that you also have to get emotional and all these different takes and all these different angles and the humor of it. It was just so challenging, but it was because of the, I just really felt a responsibility to give to audiences of this movie, the same experience, the spiritual, um, kind of transcendent moment that I had reading the book and remembering the Christmas story and seeing the Christmas story through the eyes of those in poverty. And, uh, when that little girl performs, uh, as Mary in the pageant, um, uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but those were real tears. I mean, those just being when you get to the moment of filming it and you're reliant on other people to execute it um, with your leadership, it's it's uh, it's scary. But I just I was blown away by their performances and by the music and how everything came together. The girl who played Im uh, Mary in the movie, her name in the movie is Imogen. Yeah, Imogen. And she Imogene. plays. Yeah, she takes she hijacks the role of Mary uh, in yes. the Christmas pageant. Yeah, she's extraordinary. She was phenomenal. I mean, they were all phenomenal. How old is she in real life? Uh, she's 12. I think she might be 13 by now. I'm not sure. Okay. But she's uh, too young to be that good. <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah. She's amazing. I mean, the expression, the range, she was yeah. amazing. Yeah. What was the, so So you, you had this seed five years ago, this sense of calling about creating this movie five years ago. Was this concurrent with starting The Chosen? How did the, How does the timeline sync up with the work on The Chosen? Well, my desire to do the, to, to, to do this movie was long before The Chosen even existed, of course, before I'd even thought of it. Uh, it was when I started making The Chosen, I think the first two seasons were out when the rights holders saw it and said, okay, we do believe this would be in good hands, in Dallas's hands. And the, uh, by that point, Lionsgate, the distributor, was also interested in the book and interested in me as a filmmaker. And so I filmed this in between the filming of seasons four and five. Um, and this is the only project that I would have or my wife would have allowed me to do because we, of course, I don't ever want the chosen and filmmaking to take away from my job as a husband and father. Um, and filming is always a very challenging process. But this was the one project that we did this for and we did our best to still maintain our family time and dynamic. But, uh, yeah, I was I had I had kind of, you know, the, the Best Christmas Pageant Ever was still my dream project while I was making The Chosen, but I still had that mm. weekly reminder to pray for it. But I didn't know that it would come in the middle of The Chosen, mm. but uh, God's timing is perfect. God's timing really is perfect. I, I think that your story is such a testimony to that because it, the Lord knew that The Chosen was going to come first, and that would prepare you, yeah. at least in the eyes of the studio or the people that had the rights to the book, to give you the best Christmas pageant ever, to entrust it to you. So yeah. the greatest Christmas pageant ever. That no, that that was the, the best. Yeah, the, the best. best Christmas pageant ever. People <laughs> the best and the greatest, but it's yes, the best. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully it's the greatest <laughs> movie ever. But the, there the, you the, go. <laughs> the best Christmas pageant ever. Yeah, I mean, I think I had to be broken down and surrendered before I could get the chosen. And I think that happened seven years ago when I had a big career failure. Didn't know if I would ever make another movie or TV show. And I truly surrendered and thought, okay, I'm willing to give that up if that's what you want, which was very hard for me. And uh, I think that's when God said, well, now you're ready for The Chosen. And then after the first couple seasons of The Chosen, I think God's like, all right, now you're ready for the best Christmas pageant ever. And with the success that's come from that movie and its opening weekend and the, the response that it's had um, has been really, really humbling, but I think only came because I was humbled and, and broken and surrendered. 
Um, and I think every revival in anyone's life is preceded by brokenness. And uh, I had that, that's what it happened to me. And I think it made me better equipped to, to bring these stories to the world. Can you share about that first, you mentioned, you know, bottom, uh, reaching a kind of rock bottom that was before the chosen. I also just have to say it was so powerful to hear from Jonathan about his similar story to yours in that before being cast as Jesus in the chosen, he was also at his rock bottom financially, emotionally, you know, spiritually in many ways and just saying, Jesus, I surrender everything. And then Jesus did this incredible thing in his life to, to serve other people ultimately. And you have a parallel story. Can you share that? I, our, some yeah. of the audience may have, may have heard this before, but I know many yeah. haven't yet. And it's, it's really powerful. Yeah, mine came first. I was before Jonathan. So I'll just, we'll <laughs> always be able to say that. that my, I had my big, broken, surrendered, humbled moment first. Although I'm sure it doesn't sound very humbled and broken and surrendered to, <laughs> to, to keep saying that. But um, it was back in 2017, and I had finally gotten what I had sought in my career, which was some legitimacy. I'd made several films with varying degrees of success, but they were all independent outside of the Hollywood system. And I was really striving for that legitimacy and that affirmation that comes from you know, major Hollywood studios or producers wanting to finance or produce or distribute my projects. And I finally got that opportunity in a movie called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone uh, was finally released to theaters around the country, produced by and distributed by a couple of the biggest studios and production companies in the world. And I had finally gotten what I had wanted for so long. And then the movie completely failed. They had all these high hopes for it. It tested really well. And then it just completely bombed. And I'm home alone with my wife. What, is, just, what does that mean, by the way, just for context, for those not in the space? Like you put in X amount of money and then it like didn't make any. Can you just share any color to what it means that it, that it bombed? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, happy to go back to that place. Sorry, and, Dallas. And, no, no. Tell us about um, your worst moment more, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we hear you. We hear you were devastated. <laughs> but tell us why. What really, what really How bad was you? it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, um, when you see... Um, a, a movie's box office results. Mm -hmm. So for example, the opening weekend of the best Christmas pageant ever was $11 million, right? Now you got to remember that sounds like a lot and it is, and it was, it exceeded expectations. It was great. But uh, the, the studio that distributes the movie gets half of that. You know, the theaters take half, the, the studios take the other half. And then the studios have to get their production costs and their marketing costs repaid before anyone else starts sharing in any profits, if there are any. So when you see, some, there are sometimes a movie will come out and it'll it'll do fifty million dollars in the box office, which for the best Christmas pageant ever would, would, would be huge. I hope we reach that number. Um, but if the movie cost a hundred million to make, and the studio is only getting twenty five million of the box office, you can imagine what that's like. There's a big gap, and then there's the marketing spend that they did. So for the Resurrection of Gavin Stone, the budget was low. You know, it was a one point five million dollar production budget, which is super low. Um, so you'd think that the chances of making your money back are good. Well, then they spent six or seven million dollars on marketing. So then when the opening weekend comes and it did, I think the, I think the opening weekend number was like 1.4, 1.5 million. Well, um, that's only half of that is going to go to the studio. The second weekend, it drops even more. And so the final box office total was $2.3 million for the, for, uh, for Resurrection of Gavin Stone. And so when they've spent, you know, eight, nine million dollars and they only get half of the box office, and then that means that the DVD sales and the streaming numbers are going to be low as well. So the, the number for opening weekend was lower than their lowest projection. And so within just a couple hours, we knew on Friday afternoon that it was going to be a bomb. And so I'm at my low point with my wife at home alone going, God had done so many things to get us to this point. Like it was so clear, and I, I, I knew God had called me to this. Well, he's not the author of failure. So this failure means maybe it wasn't God. Maybe I had misread the tea leaves. Maybe I had misheard what I thought was my calling, but was actually just maybe my own flesh and my own desires. And God put it on my wife's heart very explicitly, very clearly. Not an audible voice, but almost as though it was one. Uh, read the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And so together we opened up our Bibles and we, we read that story and we noticed something that we hadn't really maybe made sense of in the past, even though we'd heard the story a hundred times, which is that when the disciples came to Jesus and said, uh, people are hungry, the thousands of people that you're talking to, they're starving. We need to send them home. And Jesus says, oh, we can't send them home. They're so hungry, they'll faint along the way. 
So what does that tell you? It means he knew that they were hungry and desperate. And when you think about it, it was his fault. He's the one who'd been talking for three days. He brought them to that place of hunger and desperation. He's not dumb. He, he's, he's the God of the universe. He's preaching to them. He knows exactly how hungry they're getting, and he keeps talking. So he brings them to that place of desperation where the only solution for it is a miracle. Is turkey better or ham? If you picked either, you'd be wrong. Because the third and correct option is a free ham from Good Ranchers worth $110. During Good Ranchers Thanksgiving special, you can choose any box of their 100% American meat and wild-caught seafood and get a free 10-pound spiral-cut ham added to it for free. What I love about Good Ranchers is that it is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranches and standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. Go to GoodRanchers.com, subscribe to any of their boxes of 100% American beef, chicken, pork, or wild-caught seafood, and use my code Lila at checkout. And so when you realize Okay, not only does God sometimes allow our hunger or our desperation, and yes, sometimes our suffering, and many times he's responsible for it. Now, again, I don't believe that God, you know, sets out to create bad things to happen to people, obviously. But many times he allows it or might even steer us towards it because he has something important to, for us to learn. And in this case, it was very clear that we were thinking, all right, God has brought us here to this place of hunger and desperation. That doesn't mean he's absent, the fact that we've failed. And so that night, we thought maybe that meant the numbers were going to magically dis, you know, turn around and God was going to feed the 5,000 and multiply our, our, you know, these really small loaves and fish. That didn't happen. And so we were wondering, why did God put us in this story? What are we supposed to learn? All right, we, we've got the point that he's in this, um, or that at least we don't know that he's not, meaning he could be responsible for this hunger that we're in. Well, that night at four in the morning, I'm writing a big 15-page memo outlining everything that went wrong and how I can learn from this. And I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to make sure this never happens again. I'm a problem solver. I'm a doer. I'm an accomplisher. And I'm working on this and bing pops up on my computer, a Facebook message from someone I've never met. And he doesn't say hi, doesn't say hello, just says, remember, your job is not to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. And I'm like, did, was my computer recording what my <laughs> wife and I talked about today? Like, who did I tell? Like, how does he know that I'm trying to figure out what the loaves and fish story means in my life? And so I just responded with, what are you doing up at four in the morning? And he said, well, I'm in, the, I'm, on, I'm in Romania right now. I'm in a different time zone. And I heard about your movie. And so I just wanted to say that. And I said, can I just ask why you said that to me? And he goes, oh, that wasn't me. God told me to tell you that. And he had had a similar experience to my wife, where God had just put it on his heart. Tell Dallas it's not his job to feed the 5,000, right? And he didn't want to, because he's like, that's a condescending thing to someone to say to someone I barely know. I've only talked to them on Facebook a couple of times. And God just put it on his heart. So he sent it to me, and it changed my life. Because for the first time in my life, I truly grasped the notion that my job and our job is to make the best five loaves and two fish that we can, to bring it to God. And if he deems it worthy of acceptance, the transaction's over. Whether or not he feeds 5,000 with it is up to him and not us. And when you get to that point in your life where you can truly be okay with that, whatever your loaves and fish are going to be, you're okay with it. If, they, if he doesn't, whatever the results are, you don't take responsibility for if you're in his will. Um, that was a life-changing knowledge for me. And it, it becomes a superpower because you, you stop caring what other people think. It leads you to make crazy decisions like crowdfunding a TV show about Jesus um, and knowing that it probably won't work and then it exceeds your expectations. And, and, you know, based on a short film I did for my church's Christmas Eve service about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherds, I mean, all these things that have led to this conversation um, were, were preceded by brokenness and surrender and, and, uh, and humility. And I, I hope that if you and I talk in five, seven years about other Bible projects that I'm doing or whatever, that uh, that, that message never changes and that my posture never changes. I'm curious in, in what you're describing about the creation of the resurrection of Gavin Stone and then that rock bottom kind of experience you had before creating The Chosen, which has just been this global phenomenon. If you felt called by God specifically to do the resurrection and that was part of the confusion for you, like why isn't this more successful, but God was teaching you to be faithful even if this thing that he wants you to do reaches maybe one person. I mean, it reached a lot more than one pe person, yeah. obviously. Is that Was that the lesson for you? Well, absolutely, because um, when I when the movie failed, 
I assumed then, well, I guess I was wrong. He didn't call me to this. But I then had to reflect back on all the things that had happened that were so clearly God-driven, doors that had closed at the right time, windows that had opened at the right time, the fact that I couldn't get that story out of my mind when I first heard it, the resurrection of Gavin Stone, um, the fact that it really did feel while I was doing it like I was in my wheelhouse. I'm very proud of the message of the film, and I'm proud of the film. I mean, the film, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have made it, and a lot of people have been impacted by it, and, and I think it's a, a decent film. Um, and yet the results don't impact, you shouldn't impact whether or not you truly felt called to something. So there are multiple things that can, that can be evidence of whether you were called or whether it was just a dream you had because you wanted to do something. Time oftentimes is one of the factors. If, if God just doesn't let it, like when you're taking a shower, when you're well, on a walk, it just keeps coming to you and you keep, you know, you keep feeling this depth of meaning about it. That that's one sign, a mentor in your life that you can maybe go to and say, this is what I'm feeling. What do you think? You know, sometimes God can give them wisdom. Of course, God's word is, is above all. Um, but God's word doesn't always speak to specifically Dallas Jenkins, 2020, you know, or whatever year I'm dealing with something. So sometimes you have to find in, in God's word, what the general principle is that applies to your situation and draw from that prayer, obviously, but even sometimes in prayer, you go, you know, if you're a human being, uh, and, and you know, you're like, all right, I feel like God's giving me something, but I don't know if it's God or me. And I'm sure we've been wrong at times. I'm sure we have, we have, uh, thought something was from God, but really it was our flesh. That's the faith life. That's the journey. That's wrestling with principalities and powers of this world. Right. And so, um, ultimately, um, what you have to realize is that the, the positive or negative results of the initiative are not the gauge as to whether or not God called you to it, because God may sometimes call you to something that isn't about the success of the results of, you know, by the world's definition, but it's something he had specifically for you. And so we sometimes measure our relationship with God, our ministry, our job, whatever, by the numbers by the success, I'm sure you, you you have a team of people who are analyzing the number of downloads of each podcast episode, and it's hard for you to kind of remember. I'm not doing this for the numbers, um, and it's hard to remember that when you have a job. It's your full-time job, and you have a staff, and uh, success in the world is measured by those numbers. But um, when you can get to that place where you just are focused on that North Star of, I'm pleasing God, I want to be in His will, I want to give to the world what He's given to me, um, and I can be okay with whatever the result is that is. Uh, it, it really can be it can be life life changing. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because this is a premium product made from the best materials for your little one. And everylife.com is a pro life company. When you go to everylife.com slash join, you can join the Changing Lives Club. This way you can set up a subscription to get your diapers and your wipes, these premium products delivered right to your door for your little one. And after three months of the subscription, you will be able to donate for free a month's supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So what are you waiting for? Go to everylife.com slash join, join the Changing Lives Club, use the code LILA at checkout, Get 10% off your order, start your subscription, and after three months, you can donate a full month supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. I think about what Mother Teresa said, which is that God's not calling us to be successful. He's calling us to be faithful. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the truest fidelity is when you don't see the results. You don't get to see the fruit immediately. And maybe you even take the hits or you feel humiliated in the worldly sense and you still yeah. stick with it. You still keep trying have you always felt a call to be a filmmaker and when did you first feel that call and how did you first respond to it? Yeah. Back in high school, uh, I was a freshman and my dad had just recently introduced me to great films. I grew up in a fairly uh, protected environment, which I'm grateful for. My parents, um, you know, in my formative years really, you know, I was only, wa you know, whatever media I was watching was Saturday morning cartoons and, um, you know, faith-based or family, you know, movies. And then I get to about eighth grade and my dad's like, all right, now it's time for you to watch some of the classics, you know? So I'm watching The Godfather and, and uh, Bonnie and Clyde and all these great movies. And, and my freshman year of high school, I watched the um, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson. And uh, I'm watching, there's a scene in that movie where I, I got so inspired and so excited and so emotional. I'm like standing up off the couch. I'm just so into the scene. I remember thinking, whatever that is, 
you know, whatever it is to tell that story to result in me reacting this way. I want to do that. And I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be cool to do that with stories of faith, stories of, 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 of the God experience, of the Christian experience? Because I don't see that anywhere other than typically through crappy movies, forgive my, my, my language there, but I mean, True. just movies so that just aren't very good, that are cheesy or whatever. <laughs> and it's just, they feel like church basement films. Uh, not all of them, of course, there were, uh, but back when I was growing up, there were so few that were watchable. This is even before Veggie Tales, right? And so, um, but I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so that's, I started really digging into that and being a storyteller and uh, in college, I pursued it and it just, it just never, it, it just became so clear that there was nothing else that I was being called to do. And so that's, that's where it started. And then, it, you know, what got me ultimately to, to talking to you about the chosen and best Christmas pageant ever is its own, you know, long, long tail, but, but that's where it, that's where it began for sure. So was there a, already any kind of ecosystem that you were being raised in besides obviously your faith and a great family, but in terms of other filmmakers that you knew or raised, you know, there's a lot of the, the, this typical story of like children raised in Hollywood or raised by actor parents, easier for them to be actors, easier for them to be filmmakers. How did you start from the inspiration of this looks amazing. This moved me. I want to move people using this art form to actually getting to do it yourself. Yeah, I didn't have any kind of ecosystem or infrastructure to plug into, and certainly not in the faith world. I mean, in the faith world, there were, back then there were few Christian colleges that had filmmaking uh, majors or opportunities to to, to explore this. Um, you, you know, you'd see other independent filmmakers uh, that would just do these super low budget movies that took off, and and then that would get them more money or more opportunities and. So that's kind of what I was hoping to do, but I didn't know how. And so uh, ironically enough, when I graduated from high school or from college, um, by that point, the Left Behind books um, had gotten to be very successful and my dad wrote them. And so regardless of your feelings about the Left Behind books, uh, they were very successful. And there was a, a production company out of Louisville, Kentucky that had helped their own, that had felt their own calling to, to make these movies. And so they got the rights from my dad and I went to work for this company as a, as a secretary, just you know, low level, minimum wage kind of, uh, um, run, you know, making mail runs and picking up packages and giving notes to scripts. You weren't like, and, dad, come on, this is your, your book. Give me the, give me a role. But were you interested in acting or anything? Or you're like, I'm happy to push paper for, for now. Well, no, I was happy to push paper. I mean, I had been an actor in high school and some in college, but it was I very much, I had a focus on directing. And so, uh, it, you know, my dad, to his credit, uh, you know, didn't push any, influence on this production company. I mean, just, he told him I was interested in film. And so they brought me in as, as a low level secretary and he was happy for me to pay my dues and not exert any influence there. About three, four years into it, uh, they were about to make the movie and, um, it was just coming out a little differently than I think my dad and I had expected or hoped. And, and so, uh, we started our own company and, and my dad had the means to get me started, you know, not huge budgets, but like had enough means from the sales of his books to, to at least help get me started. And so we did independent projects. You know, my first movie was 25 years old. I produced it. I didn't direct it and uh, learned on the fly, you know, and I worked at, found a couple of people who were in the business and then you bring them on to help you. And then you hire the director and you hire the cast. And, and uh, sometimes ignorance is bliss because you're, you're breaking rules that you didn't even know existed. And that can be a good thing. And sometimes you learn, you know what, Hollywood has figured some things out. I need to plug into that system a little bit more. And so over time you just kind of build, but yeah, I was, Many ways, I did. I, I obviously got a benefit from my dad having the means to be able to help me get going, and to get also to get a low level job at a company. Sometimes those are even uh, difficult to do, um, but I worked my way up there and got a lot of experience, and ultimately was able to to uh, to execute some of what I felt God calling me to. What goes on inside of your mind when you are having this moment, this visualization? I mean, you had it when you read the best Christmas pageant ever. You cried. You visualize this should this would be an amazing film. I mean, it sounds like you've had that so many times, and of course, you've had that with the chosen and brought these scenes that you know are two thousand years old, literally. Billions of people have meditated upon them, but you brought them to life in this incredibly powerful way. What goes on in your mind as a director and as a writer and a producer when you're visualizing this and then? What does that translation process look like? This is maybe a huge question, but I'm very curious. What does that translation process look like for you to bring that into life? Well, that's the job, right? I mean, is is um, I my co-writers and I come up with the ideas, pr primarily rooted in scripture. First, we always take these 
stories, that's where we start. And then we try to work our way backwards to develop a plausible backstory that's informed by history, by culture, by other biblical capital T truths. So even if we don't have a fact, we want it to still be true, capital T, right? To accurately reflect the character and, uh, and intentions of Jesus and the Gospels and of the entire Bible. It's a sacred responsibility, especially as, you know, I'm sure there's someone listening now, if they've gotten this far, who's uncomfortable with seeing anything portrayed that's not directly from Scripture. Um, And so we take that seriously, and we understand it, but we do believe that there's freedom to have a holy imagination and to try to, as long as we're not contradicting the character of God, which is, of course, debatable. Um, That's why we've got different denominations and uh, different uh, uh, faith traditions. But the, the, the challenge becomes, okay, so now I've got a picture in my mind of how I want this to look, how I want it to feel, what we're trying to say, what we're hoping people take from this about God. And just also just from a strictly entertaining perspective, we want to make sure it's good television. Uh, but then you get to the set and now you are, uh, you're, you're responsible to lead and you're responsible to share your vision and to communicate well. But ultimately you are in the hands of many other people now too. The cast, the hair and makeup folks, the costumer, the production designer, the cinematographer, the sound engineer, um, they are all doing, they're all trying to execute your vision, but they're all experts in their field in a way that I'm not. I can't do what they do. They have to do it. And so hopefully I'm a good conductor of the orchestra, but um, I now am relying on their skills, their experience, their background, and sometimes they're going to be smarter than I am, even in an idea that I had myself. They're going to point out to me why that can't be done and why this might be better. And if I'm surrounded by good people and if I'm humble enough, which I am uh, to recognize that I am not the smartest guy in the room every time, uh, there are times when I am. There are times when only I can make a certain decision, but there are other times where I've got to rely on others. And so uh, that's where my job is to be the immune system for the film. The, I'm protecting the film from my ego or anyone else's ego getting in the way or from them uh, overtaking the other departments, one op, one department overtaking the other departments in terms of influence. I just can't let that happen. And so uh, that's ultimately my job. And then to trust the Lord that uh, because this project is being done for him and it's intended to glorify and put a spotlight on his goodness, I I trust and hope that he will uh, protect me in that process. Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life coffee company on a mission to fund the pro-life movement one cup of delicious coffee at a time. Why are they called Seven Weeks Coffee? Because at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and it's the same time that the heartbeat can be first clearly detected on ultrasound. That's why Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of every sale to support pregnancy resource centers across the country. Seven Weeks Coffee is harvested from the top 1% to 2% of beans in the world. Their beans are mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, and low-acid, and they're organically farmed. Seven Weeks Coffee truly checks all the boxes. And just in time for the holiday season, Seven Weeks Coffee is having their biggest promotion yet. You can enjoy exclusive discounts, free gifts with every order, and new limited edition coffees. And exclusively for my listeners, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your order. How do you identify these are incredibly important roles? Obviously, the actors are incredibly important, but a co-writer is incredibly important. Uh, You know, everything from the costume designer, these little things, especially for someone like yourself, you have this vision. They're all such important pieces. How do you go about identifying the people to work with in a place where you're comfortable that this is someone you can trust to not just execute on your vision, but potentially innovate on your vision even more than what your vision might have been to start with. So how do you find, how do you find people that you can trust and how do you vet them? How do you identify them? Yeah, that's a great question. So you interview multiple people for each role, each mm-hmm. department head. So that's the key hair and makeup person, uh, the key, uh, cinematographer, production designer. Um, and, and that's the first thing is of course they have to have the skill set. They have to have, they have to have, um, the, the talent and the creativity uh, that, that I have to have seen, um, somewhere else. Um, this is not a show that we can have a first timer in, in a significant, uh, in a leadership position. Now there's first timers, of course, who uh, come on board, but in a leadership position, someone has to have kind of earned their stripes and work their way up to that and have experience that I can, I can vet. Um, then of course they have to be willing to defer to my ultimate vision while at the same time be strong enough to push for mm-hmm. theirs. And then 
because I always say to them, the only thing that will make me mad, there are two things that will make me mad. One is if you didn't say something Mm. that you felt strongly about and that I didn't have an opportunity to be wrong and to learn from you and to see your idea as better than mine. It's really good. So don't ever Mm. get to the point where I did something and you're thinking, well, I would have done it a different Mm. way. Um, I want to hear from you. So that that will upset me if I'm surprised by the fact that it's too late to do what you might have suggested, uh, even if it was a better idea than mine. And then the second thing is, is if ultimately I listen to you and I hear you and I consider it, but if I do overrule it and I do do something maybe differently than you might have, no pouting, no, um, you know, we, we, we're both going to make mistakes. So I'm not going to ever yell at you for making a mistake. Uh, I might be upset at times if it's a mistake of, um, not, not of, of trying and failing, but if you, you know, if it's laziness or if it's taking something for granted or if whatever it is, that might upset me, but I'm never going to be upset for you trying to do something great and it just doesn't quite work out. So we're going to, we're doing this together as long as you don't pout if I make a mistake or if I don't maybe take one of your ideas. So that's a key thing. And then, you know, some people ask, well, what about Christians? Do you hire Christians? Do you have people on your set that are Christians or not? Um, that is probably, um, I don't know where it ranks on my on my you know list, but it's pretty low um, because a it, um, if I hire someone because of their faith and not because of their skill, then yeah, we can have a, a wonderful kumbaya session of we're, we're all trying to tell you know have the great same message, but you're not actually a good production designer or you're not actually a good costumer um, or you're not as good as this other person. I think we would all agree that we wouldn't want to go into a surgeon and uh, as we're about to get surgery, go now. Wait a minute, do you? you know, can you give me the four spiritual laws from the gospels or can you, and they go, well, no, um, um, but they're a great surgeon. I think you're going to really want them to just do a good job. And then hopefully, you know, the course of building a relationship, maybe you can uh, give them a chance to hear the gospel. But uh, ultimately I hope that my cast and crew, and I know that they are, is seeing these stories and seeing me live out the hands and feet of Jesus and love unconditionally and, and have a servant's heart. But ultimately I don't have a religious litmus test for who's going to be on my set. And if anything, I'm happy when there's a diversity of thought because then that gives us a chance to, to maybe show them a, a side of, of life and a side of, 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 of God that maybe they haven't seen before on a project that they've never been part of before. So it's a long and, and important process, but ultimately um, God has brought everyone on my set to me uh, mm. for such a time as this, and it's been a great experience. We are so desperately in need of amazing Christian in its ethos content out there, especially in the feature length film TV world. And you've done it, Dallas. I mean, that's what's so special about what you're doing. The best Christmas pageant ever. And then of course, with The Chosen, you're, 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 you're out there. You are the leader. You're doing that for not just Christians, but for everyone. And I want to just thank you so much for that. What you're sharing about the background of how you went into it and the struggles you've had, I think it's really important because there's a lot of creators or people who feel called to content creation, but there's all kinds of you know missteps they can take or disappointments or struggles that they may be having in the process. I am really curious if you're willing to share one of the, maybe the hardest things that you've had to deal with as a director or as a producer in basically fighting for a great product, but then dealing with the dynamics that will come where maybe in the Christian space, it's like, well, just be nice. I don't know if this is resonating, but it's like, just be nice. Just, you know, sometimes I guess having the high, high, high standards in maybe the faith world that can maybe be a kind of a conflict because you're dealing with people that they want to be appreciated for themselves and see them for their at. And you're like, no, this is a business in terms of creating great art. So we need to have these high standards. I don't know if there's something you can share about a way you've navigated that and kept your your product at such high quality. The content that you're creating, these films that you're creating, the quality is so wonderful. The heart is there. How have you done that? And what's a challenge you've overcome to accomplish that? Well, thank you for all of that. Uh, it's very kind. And also it's very important um, to navigate that. And so I would say that no more than, no matter what in any job or career calling that you have or ministry calling or whatever that five and two principle the notion that it is not your job to feed the 5000 it is to provide the loaves and fish now that comes with the fact that uh we do want to make the best loaves and fish that we can 
Jesus could have just had loaves and fish magically appear in the laps of everyone in that field. And uh, yet he said, I need food. You know, does someone, someone bring me food? He wants us to be part of the process. And so part of making good loaves and fish at the risk of sounding uh, cheesy is, you know, you do, there's also ingredients that you want to follow. You want to be a good baker. You want to be a good fisherman. Um, And so part of that involves, I don't think it's in conflict to, to demand excellence and to work hard and to have a set that is professional. And that, that means sometimes people are going to have to be corrected. And sometimes for them to get the message, they're going to have to be corrected with some intensity. It's like parenting. Um, I don't think that, that uh, a, a firm rebuke of my child is in conflict at all with, uh, with godly living and Christian living um, and, and, and God's heart. Uh, he firmly rebukes us many times in Scripture and in life today. So I don't believe that having a high standard and fighting for excellence and making sure that the greatest story ever told uh, is, is told well through the most influential medium ever developed, and that's media— um, I think that that's not in conflict. And so if you come on our set, um, it won't, it, you know, there will be times when you'll see, of course, in my behavior as a believer in Christ, hopefully I am living out the hands and feet of Jesus. And hopefully I am living a Christ-like life as much as possible. But of course, I'm a sinner. Of course, I'm a flawed human being. And that's true of everyone on our set, Christian or not. Hopefully you are seeing a Christ-like um, attitude and behavior and setting. That said, it is a professional set. You will not see us uh, in a prayer circle um, other than, you know, if, if a few of us decide to do that on our own, we're doing that. But there is not corporate required church like, uh, you know, structure that takes place on our set. It's a business mm-hmm. and it's a professional business. And most of our cast and crew are not uh, mm-hmm. traditional churchgoers, or at least, you know, probably a little bit more mm-hmm. than half of them aren't. So um, I don't think it's any more challenging than uh, any other job that anyone has. Um, you know, obviously in a, this business, there's fewer Christians in in the media space than than maybe in other spaces uh, for various reasons. But uh, I do believe that's even more reason to be called to it and to be salt and light. What's your advice for aspiring filmmakers, actors, people who feel called to the media space to create amazing content for God? Yeah, I mean, besides the, the, the truth that I'll just keep pounding is the, the five and two principle, <laughs> but I think also... Um, you know, part of that making being as concentrating on being as good as you can be, truly mm-hmm. learn, truly be curious, never stop being curious, uh, pursue every opportunity to learn. There's no job or opportunity or class that should be beneath you as you're trying to be good at this. Um, maybe instead of trying to focus on success, try to focus on quality first, and perhaps success will come. And if it never does, then maybe that is something that uh, you know maybe should just be a hobby or maybe a second job and not your primary occupation, who knows? But I would also say, don't limit yourself to only faith-based projects or only non-faith-based projects. In fact, there was a time in my career where I didn't want to do faith-based projects because it wasn't very cool. And, uh, and God called me to tell stories of his people and of, of, of himself. And, um, so I think ruling out faith-based options, some people want to do because they don't want to be tagged and relegated to just to one category. But then there's other folks who are like, well, I don't want my kid doing anything that's not about God. Um, or I don't want to ever do anything that doesn't point people to him. Well, I would argue that um, you got to remember that sometimes there's a movie or a, or, or a TV show or a piece of media. They're going to hire people and there's going to be someone in that position. Why not have it be you? Why not have it be someone who can be salt and light in, a, in an area that's very dark? Why not br- think of yourself as a potential of salt and light, of influence in a place that rarely has that. Now, of course, you never want to do something that's going to contradict the character of God, but someone has to play the part of Judas, you know, in a, in a, in a show. And that's, uh, th- that character obviously is doing uh, awful things and even demonic things. And, uh, and, and, and an actor has to inhibit that. So don't limit yourself to only the, the roles that are, that are, uh, you know, that, that are Christians, you know, you may have an opportunity to be salt and light in an area that doesn't normally get that. Really good. I, I especially love that, uh, you know, work hard at it, try hard at it. If it's not really succeeding over time, you know, maybe pray about, is this what God is calling me to do? Cause there is going to be momentum that God will give a creator to make it have longevity. Right. And then I also right. love the advice about do both faith-based films and not like mix it up, try different things and keep it excellent, you know, make excellence your aim. And I think that's a a call for all Christians in any kind of work that they do, but especially needed in the arts. Uh, What was your favorite scene of the best Christmas pageant ever, Dallas? And then what impact do you hope the movie will have 
on the people that are going to see it? Well, thank you for that, uh, because that question, the answer is the same. Um, you know, the, the scene from the end of the book that made me weep and made me so moved and seeing Jesus through the eyes of uh, people in poverty, people in need, people who mm-hmm. haven't heard the story before, and how they can actually bring something to us, those of us who've heard the story and believe the story. Maybe we can learn something or see something new that we hadn't considered before. And uh, that scene where that takes place in the best Christmas pageant while they're performing it um, is uh, so every time I watch it, it's like every time I read it, it moves me. It makes me um, uh, kind of renewed in my passion for the birth of Christ and in my calling from God to share that message. The last six words of the movie are the same last six words of the book. Unto you a child is born. And that's what I hope people walk away with. I hope people come away going, A, do I believe that? That un, that for me, unto me, a child was born. A child uh, came as, a, as a, an innocent suffering servant, not as a conquering king. Um, do I believe that? And if I do, can I live that out? What does that look like? Will I love the least of these? Will I give unconditionally? Will I be willing to sacrifice, sacrifice myself and surrender maybe some of my own fleshly desires in order to uh, bring light to a world that, that needs it? Um, and so that's what I'm hoping people c- walk away with. And that's what we're hearing from people who've seen it is that they feel not only do they enjoy the film, but that they, they feel different. They feel like they want to be uh, the hands and feet of Jesus. And I love that it's a family film, that it's something that people can see. Yeah. It's so rare to find an excellent, you know, truly classic, heart-moving film. And that's what this fit video movie is. And it's for the whole family. You can take your kids and enjoy it. And it's going to be great for everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Dallas, uh, I, I know that you're in the middle of releasing this great movie. What is next for you? I am curious. I know there's future seasons of The Chosen and there's future releases of The Chosen. I am just curious if there's anything else you can share about what God is maybe stirring in you to do in the arts for for faith and for his people and to share the gospel. Anything else you can share with us? Yeah, so right now um, we are putting the finishing touches, which will take over the next couple months, on season five um, that we filmed earlier this year. And that's going to come out in theaters in April of next year. Uh, I I always try to remind people it takes longer to make this show than it does to watch it. So uh, please be patient. It's going to it's it's a long process. Uh, While we're working on that, I'm also uh, working with my writers on the writing of season six which we're going to be filming next year. So that's the crucifixion season. And so that's uh, certainly intense to write. And then um, we've also got our animated series, The Chosen Adventures, which is kind of the animated version of some of what you've seen, but through the eyes of uh, two characters who you saw in season one, episode three, Jesus and uh, Loves the Little Children. Um, and that's really fun, but also really life-giving uh, for the family. And uh, The Chosen in the Wild with Bear Grylls, uh, we filmed that. That's going to be coming out next year where he takes... Uh, some of the actors and myself separately out into the wild, and we really explore God's uh, heart in, in, in that in that context. And then uh, we're developing a, a mini series about Joseph, um, you know, uh, from uh, the Old Testament. And after the chosen seven seasons, I'm going to take a break, and then I'm going to come back with I want to tell the story of Moses in wow. a three season show. Oh wow! Yeah, so we got a lot. That lot sounds the chosen amazing. Bible universe is building. Yeah, yeah. That sounds amazing. So you you need to live to be over a hundred years old, Dallas, because you've got a lot of the Bible <laughs> to create, and those are those are that's all sound amazing. I can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, for I'm, thank you for using your gifts for His kingdom in such an incredible way. It's blessed so many people. Thank you. It's really uh, means a lot. Thank you for helping spread the word and for being a. Uh, a partner in all of this. So uh, we'll keep up the, the work together. Thank you. And everybody go see the best Christmas pageant ever. It is the best Christmas pageant ever. Enjoy. <laughs> thank you so much, Dallas. <laughs> okay. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.